Right. Gosh, yeah, I see. So this is totally, totally different. Yeah, so this is the new U building. Uh, we actually haven't ever been in this room. We usually use a different conference room, but it was, um, it was occupied for some reason. Yeah. Um, this is the brand new building, the U. Okay. It's only opened yeah. up. And it's been recently. opened up about a month and already has had two smashed doors. Yeah. Oh, the sliding, did you not see it coming in, the sliding doors? No. Oh. They're smashed on one side. Oh. Happened at the Halloween thing on Tuesday. Did oh. someone do it or was it like a technical... I think somebody did it, but I don't oh, know. Why. But that's the second time. Crazy John. Somebody yeah. already, yeah, probably. Somebody yeah. already broke it, and then it got repaired, and then somebody broke the same thing again. <laughs> so. Um, Some things don't change. Yeah, pretty it's much. Um, camera no good, no. No. Fair. All the boys were using it there on Tuesday night. Huh? Lads were using it there on Tuesday night. Of course they were. Oh, well. Yeah. Gosh, it's nice here though. It's, it's very nice. Yeah, 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 very nice view. Our uh, our FM studio actually has like a window overlooking the whole thing. Somebody. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Very privileged. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all. Geez, it's so like it is very well. Kind of the heart of it is exactly the same. The same. Like mm. I always find, like should the Henry Grattan building even smells the same. <laughs> <laughs> and everything is in exactly the same place. Only there's stuff like I because I took a walk around it before I come over here. Stuff like there's a gap where the phones used to be because oh, there, the there were pay phones yeah, yeah, yeah. and um and stuff like that you know is, but everything else is in pretty much exactly the same place except where the library was doesn't seem to be the library anymore but uh, oh well, where you know, was the library uh you know the henry grattan mm -hmm. bi building and then there's the what was called the extension which is okay. kind of the streety bit oh yeah oh, the street yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 so it was it was over there oh Strange, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and actually, that was only when I was in second year. When it was when I was in first year, it was the top floor of the Henry Grattan building. Oh wow! Oh. It's been jumping around a lot. And it was t like it was tiny. Yeah, as you it must imagine. have been tiny, yeah. tiny, yeah. tiny. Now it's all the way down yeah. there. Yeah. yeah, you could never get a seat, and uh, and of course there'd be people sitting outside in the corridor smoking. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, that's, Fair that's, enough. That's, yeah, that's, different like times. That. Yeah, different yeah, times. yeah, yeah. That was pre two thousand and two. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So that's that, that's that's how much has changed. I think it was two thousand and six. Was it? Was it? What year was smoke about? Oh God! It was. It was, it was before that. Well, was it was about two thousand and four. Four. Yeah, yeah. Possibly yeah. Yeah. No, maybe even slightly earlier. Yeah. But I think did I think most kind of workplaces in yeah. that kind of. Maybe banned a couple of years before oh. that. Jeez, you can't say we're not topical on this show, can you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I work in the pub and uh, we completely disregarded it for years after. Really? Yeah. 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 It, um, so no, you could, you, you could, you could. I met somebody earlier who I know who was reminiscing about sitting in the lecture theatre smoking a cigarette. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> Neil of oil just, yeah, exactly. just at the very top of the thing. The person that I was looking at, I'm originally from Shannon, and I was looking, there's, there's a very funny Facebook page, you know, where people have photos from the 80s and that, and there's a photo of, of the teachers where I went to national school, you see, from, say, the late 1980s, and there's a kind of, you know, who can you identify? And somebody said, Mr. Byrne, legend, smoked 10 cigarettes in the classroom every day, <laughs> best teacher I ever had. And the the national school teacher. Yeah, exactly. That's just bizarre. That's really yeah. amuse yourself for a few minutes like, having a cigarette. We uh, we had an English teacher who used to smoke his pipe. Yeah, in the, in the oh classroom. Yeah. That was back in the nineteen twenties. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it just goes to show. That, um, yeah, yeah, some things have changed a bit. The thought yeah. of like a national school teacher smoking 10 cigarettes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> as well. <laughs> no, they were probably major or yeah. cows, I'd say, would have been more like you. Here, I just get rid of this or I'm going to eat it. Um, right, um, do you want to do your usual, what you've done for the past? Oh, few? yeah, okay. So, um, Rich, what we'd like to do is we try to make you a bit of ease, you know, okay. if, unless you weren't already in your own surroundings of DCU. But uh, there's something that we generally do is try to bring you down to our level a small bit. Not as bad as it sounds, I promise. <laughs> Um, so we went to a, an event here in college, it was run by, by two of the societies uh, last week and it was karaoke mocktails. So um, Colm did not participate in the mocktails, mainly because they didn't arrive, but secondly because he loves 6% cider. And uh, Colm had two cans and he got up and he gave a fantastic rendition. Yeah, I think so too. Um, so let's, you can have a little laugh at this, or who knows. The end bit is the key bit. <laughs> 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 
Wait for it. <laughs> your laugh, the love, your laugh, laugh gets yeah. me every single time. <laughs> your laugh. Yeah. Oh, very good. Yeah, no. Very good. Um, I mean, I, I picked a crowd pleaser, what can I say? Okay. <laughs> so, now you can't be in any way intimidated in front of these three lovely boys. So now, okay. Exactly, because we always, like, some guests have said, like, geez, like, three people, like, intervening, it is a bit intimidating. It, it is but, a bit like going for a job interview. Yeah, yeah. but we're, we're not. With the most, inf- like, Google aren't even this casual, like. Yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> we're very informal. Um, we're recording on iPads and iPhones, for God's sake. Um, right, okay, yeah, we'll get started. Greg, I'm going to let you to bring it in this time. Okay, doke. <clears throat> in case you didn't know, you're listening to In Conversation With... My name is Greg, I'm joined here um, in our, we'll call it a studio, with my lovely co-host, Colm. Hello. And my good friend, Gavin. How you doing? How are you today? Not too bad. Is mm-hmm. Gavin not? <laughs> I like that he said co-host, Colm, good friend, Gavin. Yeah, like, well, neither of us are the yeah, other. I don't want to be too like, yeah. concrete about it. Um, we are joined here today, uh, our second interview this week. Second interview this week, yeah. Second interview this week, and um, not that it's any less important, but we are joined here by Rachel English of RTE. Rachel, thank you very much for making the trip out today. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. But it's, uh, not, it's not unfamiliar it's surroundings not unfamiliar for you. Territory. No, I was a student here, student of communications, a very long time ago. <laughs> um, back when it was, well, there was really only the Henry Grattan building, the two old buildings in the canteen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So quite a bit has changed since then and yeah. as I said to Rachel on the way in we are all also communications mm-hmm. study. and she actually students. said that because obviously we are the butt of a lot of jokes around the colleges she said that that was actually a thing a thing when she was here as well that oh. it was just like yeah enjoy your time now because you're not going to get employed and things like that wow. yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad you proved it wrong yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly no, I remember <laughs> all, the, all the jokes <laughs> over in the slipper from the engineers about glad to see you're enjoying yourselves now because you won't be when you leave etc <laughs> <laughs> etc et yeah what was what was communications like then yeah, did you enjoy the course different. I really liked it I did um, because I really liked my class um, my class were brilliant they were fantastic there were about 65 of us and I did have that feeling that I think you're very lucky if you get when you go somewhere and I remember after only say a week thinking gosh yeah this is for me these are my people (laughs) and um so yes I did I mean can I remember an awful lot of it no but but but, we won't go into specific modules (laughs) or anything (laughs) I'd say do you remember CM 102 (laughs) I'd say so many of them have changed because obviously all the lecturers have changed and people kind of had their own idiosyncrasies in fact I there were a few of us out recently and and somebody ah, passed a comment it was something to do with an IQ test and one of the others turned to her and said of course if you'd been listening to Bill Doris in first year psychology you would have known that when you were 17 <laughs> so it's always there um, but what brought you across to the to the east coast of the big smoke after growing up in, in Clare um, I think like a lot of people um, not just of that era of any era really I, I was kind of a bright lights big city teenager and I just wanted to I wanted to get to Dublin. I filled out my CAO form with 10 things that were in Dublin. Um, I just, my horror was that, and you know, and I'm very fond of Shannon where I'm from, and you know, this is no slur on my family either, but I was just, I just wanted to go to out, out and see the yeah, world. Yeah. And, uh, and and Dublin was at that stage, I suppose, about as, as far away as you could possibly go. I had the horrors of, you know, getting a course in the University of Limerick and, you know, when I, I'd be able to live at home. And I remember the career guidance teacher saying, would you not put that down? I was thinking, no, no, I'll just, just put down anything that, that means I can get out. Letter penny IT. Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny, I was talking to a guy I worked with recently and he who was saying, and I feel exactly the same, that if somebody had made him do transition year, he just would have left school because I, I just couldn't have done another year. I just, mm. just, just wanted to, you know, that hope sense that there's a whole world out there and I'm not seeing it here. Was that a trend of people coming to Dublin? Was there many of your schoolmates that would have gone to Dublin as well? No, I think I was the first person from my school to go to DCU. Oh, wow. It doesn't I like I it what just wasn't a thing that people did. Like I, I remember I had to send away for the guidebook yeah. um, myself because it, it wasn't really something that was seen as an option. I mean there was perhaps maybe a couple of people from my year went to U C D maybe one to Trinity. Other than that, if you were going to college, it was pretty much 
either Limerick or Galway. Or the one other thing was, there were two guys in my class did aeronautical engineering, and you couldn't do that in UL at the time. You had to go to Queens, so they so they went even further. They went all the way to Belfast. But um, other than that, no, there was there wasn't a big thing about going say, away. I don't know about Waterford as a whole, but definitely my school, Dublin, is not really talked about that much I mean it's very much if you're going to university it's UL or UCC and then a lot of people do stay in Waterford but I was always gonna like Dublin was always kind of the option for me I wasn't initially I wasn't allowed for Dublin on my CAO my mum was like nope cost too much yeah, not a chance that, that is yeah. way more of a thing now and I'm very yeah. conscious yeah. of that like when I when I was there was there were for start there was no student accommodation mm. when I went to the yes city. because I, I we saw that you did live in Diggs for the first year of yeah. uh, we have we have a segment on that yeah <laughs> oh Diggs oh we know all about yeah Diggs. exactly <laughs> they were so nice and I wasn't I was, I was their horror you know um, just party in every day of the week yeah and then in second year we lived up in Shanless Road and then in third oh that must have been year, handy for you yeah, yeah, yeah that was very handy and then in third year in James's Avenue just beside Croke Park so oh, that would have been a bit of a did you get the bus there the bus. yeah so I was going to say that's been a bit of a no walk money, yeah. but, but you know walking distance to town it was great yeah exactly town, sure, he li- Greg lives in Marino he walked here Marino, today yeah. yeah I was in Diggs in Clontarf last year and I had to get the 104 bus have you ever got the 104 bus no, no it's and awful. I, I, yeah, I'd say the walk was probably like it even could, more enjoyable yeah. than getting it that. It goes bus, straight to, to DCU, but uh, it could go to Collins Avenue straight Huge ahead. But no, loop. it goes around about to Bowmount. It stops at Bowmount, picks yeah, everyone up at Bowmount. That's where I was in Diggs. Yeah, yeah, oh, that's a, what's 16, what's too bad. Sixteen A. Yeah, I think yeah. my my digs out of probably the four of us now were probably the handiest because I live in Dunny Kearney yeah. and it's just literally uh, but it's, a bus. You see, yeah, well, a one bus that takes me. I don't have a bus. Yeah, I know, but uh, yeah, it's literally just a half an hour's walk straight down Collins Avenue to my house, so I'd probably get the best of it. I win the digs. I win the digs uh, race. I live with a ninety-year-old man. He's ninety. On, Tom's ninety on Monday. Oh really? Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Can I have a celebrate celebratory can yeah, of Guinness. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, but we have a great time. We have kind of Guinness every night, um, have, a, have a chat, and um, tells me some stories I may or may not have heard before. <laughs> but you're too polite to tell them otherwise. <laughs> no, I've learned a polite way to do it in, in the last couple of months. Like, it's just like, you kind of interject, you're like, oh, John Broderick, he was and, a fabricator, wasn't he? Yeah. And you kind of tell him all the little bits that you know about yeah, him. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, if, only, if only, instead of telling me stories, he like, asked me, I don't know. Like academic things and that way I could learn them and yeah. pass college. Um <coughs> but yeah basically what like um Dublin is never really thought of like in we had like career guidance from TY onwards uh, that was just one, one hour a week where we talked about CAO and all that kind mm-hmm. of thing and Dublin was never really pushed it was always they were always looking at courses in Limerick or Cork or yeah. well if they're there if you're close to them in Munster yeah um, like, and having said that there is another another guy that was in my year that is in DC I rarely ever see him now but I think it is just the two of us from our school here and then in Dublin as a whole I think I only knew about probably five people in the entire uh, yeah same city, here yeah. I was saying that to somebody recently and they were kind of being serious I said I came to Dublin when I was 17 I knew not one person yeah, I, didn't I had person, no I cousins no family nobody from home not a sinner Mm, but I think that like I was very much the same like coming to DCU. I originally did EPL, um, and for I did two days. yeah for two days, and then I switched into communications <laughs> because you, do that still you know like yeah. I wanted to enjoy the short three years ahead of me rather than the rest of my life. Um, but there is that all right? Yeah. Isn't there? Um, but even in EPL, and then I'll, well coming into communications, I did know somebody because I only found out about the course through a friend from home. Um, but yeah, I rare didn't know anybody in EPL and knew very little people in communications but I think that pushed me to go and make more friends um, just out of necessity Someone like you kind of had to yeah. yeah yeah, it was like his mum like gave him like a little cue card of how to make friends hi my name is Colin <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Waterford <laughs> that's nice uh, Rachel so when you did communications had your your eyes set on anything on radio broadcasting specifically what was, yeah what was the aim going into communications oh gosh I haven't a clue I think if anything I wanted to be a print journalist but you see at that time there were well there were very very few journalism courses in fact there were only two there was Rath what Mines. was then Rath Mines yeah. College of Commerce yeah. or there was the, what was a diploma here but it was post what's now I think the MAJ but it was, oh, it, yeah. it was a diploma at the time so I did succumb to kind of the, the career guidance pressure in a way because you know the old thing you get at school about which will get the <coughs> points to do a degree would you not do a degree you know rather than going to the College of Commerce so 
I um, but the options were so limited that I kind of read up about communications and I thought, God, that sounds that sounds fantastic. So um, I I always the journalism thing was always in my head, but I had various other ideas along the way. But it it was kind of the thing that I always came back to, and I did do radio from I don't know how much it's changed it, at that stage everybody did it for a while in first year and then going into second year you have to pick whether to do radio video or photography um, because th there was no I mean there was no multimedia stuff you know there, there were still typewriters to be honest uh, <laughs> I'm not making that up I mean there weren't many but there were a few and um, so I had actually picked to do photography and there was a friend of mine who didn't get a place in photography and she was really upset and I kind of thought she got a place in radio instead and I thought God, it's not, she's really upset and it's not the end of the world for me so I'll do radio, I'll swap <laughs> places with her and, uh, and I loved it. Are you sure you still friends with her? Um, no, oh. but the amazing thing is, gosh, um, there was... Uh, there was um, there were two girls. I remember we all kind of did a big swap and one of the radio people ended up doing radio or doing sound rather in a completely different way because um, she ended up becoming a sound engineer. In mm. fact, she spent several years of her life on tour with Oasis. So I could imagine... Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> you, are, you are pressing the button over oh. Oh. So, uh, Dream the Dream job. Like. So, um, yeah, so we just got to show you, never, you never know where, mm -hmm. where people are going to end up. And Sinead, who I swapped to do photography with, Gosh, I don't know what became of her. Oh. That's, I mean, there are probably it's kind of her fault. Probably, probably about thirty or forty people who I could say yes, I know where they are, and then there there would be another twenty to thirty disappeared. Yeah, yeah, I would, and mostly that would be because they left Ireland. Okay. I would say. And has DC changed much since you're here? Like, was there big society life back in when you were here? There was no student bar. There was just the slipper. Um, as I said, there was no accommodation. So there used to be what Still were known <laughs> as receptions, whereby there was there was somebody there was a guy who was the Guinness rep, and he'd have like your your society would apply for to get a keg, oh and God. then you'd have a keg in a lecture room, and you supposedly you, you were supposed normally supposed to have a guest speaker or something, but basically it would be it would be about fifty people standing around a keg. So Just that that was. That was kind of none of our society of events have a keg of yeah. so. We just Way get our game. we just get Domino's pizza. Like. Yeah. yeah, no, that that was that was that was the big thing, and um, and then there were discos in the canteen, and um, yeah, and that was and a, a, very occasionally a band. And um, when I was in first year, um, Pat O'Mahony, who a lot of people might know down the years, was the ENTS officer, and a lot of the entertainment was provided by um, this group of fellows in third year communications in CS3 who had like an a cappella group, I can't remember the names <laughs> and then, but it's funny, lots of them went on to become better known for doing other things. Sorry, like guys, just need to have a quick look up yeah, the ceiling for a second. Did you touch it? Second time this happened. Yeah, this happened with uh, David McCullough. Is this so. Sorry, Oh, no, you're grand. Oh, right, work away, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks. And that one there as well. Is it white? Yeah. Yeah. And that part of the seat is quite finished. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. <sighs> that happens more often than you think. I'm just going to put a tab on that there and we'll make it easy just to. Oh, yeah, that is a good idea. Yeah. Uh, and I can pick up. Yeah. And lots of them became better known for other things like. Um, Ardlow Hanlon and Barry Murphy. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. yeah, yeah. They they could actually all sing. There were about seven or eight of them in it. And and I met I was at a funeral recently and, and I met a couple of others who were in that group and because they were singing at the funeral, they can still sing. So um yeah, so that was that that was a, a lot of the entertainment centered around them. What societies were there then? Were, were you part of many? I was in MPS Oh. oh, I was gonna ask. What was NPS? <laughs> yeah, because that's that's kind of what. Well, bar us, obviously, all them communications. What brought us together was being part of the media production society and get thrown together for an assigned radio show last year. So yeah. I was just wondering, it was NPS. Yeah, yeah it was drama, 
debating um I think that was about it. I mean, mm. there were there were lots of others, but obscure yeah. kind of yeah, yeah, board gamey things and <laughs> stuff like that. The show. but but mainly the MPS. In fact, we had the first the first official radio station. Um, so DCFM launch. Yeah, except it was called Radio Rag Week, oh, and no. um, it was opened by uh, Ray Burke, who later became famous or infamous for various tribunal activities but he was the minister for communications at the time and it was in that era there was this section 31 of the broadcasting act which meant you, you couldn't there were a lot of people you couldn't interview and lots of students had gone around and hung up posters um, against section 31 and i remember the morning of the, the radio station starting a couple of lecturers taking all of these down for fear the minister or any of his people were offended <laughs> But um, yeah, so so we, we, we did quite a lot actually. Maybe it was, in one way, it was harder to do stuff because you couldn't just sit in a room like this and record yeah. things because the technology was so old fashioned. But in another way, the facilities that the college did have, they were in a lot less demand because okay. there, were, there were far fewer students. So it was actually easy enough to get radio studio mm. time and stuff in a way that I imagine it's probably not now. Yeah, because Joanne Cantwell did say that the, what DCUFM was when she was here as well was just one week one week broadcast yeah, during yeah, yeah. week. Yeah. I wonder that when it easy. changed actually full time broadcasting. I don't know. Like, we, we're currently running like what, 9 to 10? 9 to 10, nine 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 to to ten nine? yeah. yeah. Uh, and the slots are full completely. Yeah, well, yeah well, I mean, there was, all there's the no way then, there were so mm. few students and um, you know so few people with any particular interest in radio there's mm. one week a year i'd say it was yeah. it was more than enough <laughs> yeah. i think mps is one of the, the highest me- uh, member members, yeah. member counts of societies in in dcu anyways we'll uh, we'll move on so how did uh, claire fm gig come about um you were you had to move down from the big small <laughs> come on now you've had did. your fun up in dublin yeah, <laughs> there was a very large element of that all right i um my dad would be of an era that he wouldn't he just couldn't for a million years see that somebody could be 20 years old and not have a job because, you know, like many of his time, he left school very young himself. So when I was coming up to leaving um, college, he, he was kind of, he'd be, he'd be sort of saying, now, will you, will you do this? Will you do that? Will you write to so-and-so? And anyway, he heard that this radio station was setting up. So he said, will you just write them a letter now? So I wrote them a letter and I got an interview and um, I got the job. Not through any great skill or because I had any particular experience, though I suppose at least I had a bit of radio experience. I learned out learned years later that I got the job because you know when a local radio station is starting up and they say, Well we've got two fellas here oh. from Ennis and we have somebody from the north of the county <laughs> and we have somebody from down in Kilrush. She said, we've nobody from Shannon, second biggest town in the county, and we've nobody from Shannon. So I, apparently there were other people who were better qualified, but I was from Shannon, so <laughs> that got me the job. And the job was? It was as a reporter and newsreader. So very much setting the tone for a, a large part of your career then? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I had to learn about so much that I knew nothing about. It was kind of the original local radio station mm. in terms of there were, you know, there was a March report and there were death notices. And um, Was there any growing pains in the jobs, early mistakes or anything like that? Gosh, I nearly, I nearly lost my job after a few months for, um, you see, like being from Shannon, it's, the town and we would view people say from four or five miles out the road in six mile bridge or some places you know as of a completely different species to us like I'm, I know this is the same oh, so you're a townie the then and you look, yeah, at the, you yeah. look down yeah, on the, the cultures the, yeah, the kids yeah. who get the bus to school are kind of yeah exactly, so yeah. I was from the town and I had to read this thing one day it was the results of the Golden Vale VC schools calf rearing competition. <laughs> <laughs> that is such a local radio story. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I nearly, <laughs> lo- nearly lost my job, but uh, I, I, like, I thought this was funny to begin with, you know, and it was kind of, you know, inter- intermediate calf category, you know, Mary so and so, Scarab Community School, and all this sort of thing, and. The, and you'd, you'd read the news sitting in beside the DJ and he started to, you know, mine mooing sounds <laughs> and shaking a bucket and I started to laugh. Now, this would have been a problem anyway, but what made it a bigger problem was Golden Vale, the sponsors of the Golden Vale VC Schools Calvary Rearing Competition, owned 
about 20% of the radio station. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, the boss didn't think that anybody from Golden Vale would, would find this funny. So oh, I, remember he was, I remember him ringing and I was only back in the newsroom two minutes and I remember getting this lecture about if it ever, ever happened again. There I was, you know, with my, my towny attitude, sneering yeah. at the young people of the county, etc., etc., etc. So that, that's kind of my standout memory of the early months. Thank God. have to learn not to laugh when I find things funny. Uh, so Rachel, how did you make it to RTE then? After Claire Fell? I think um, there was something in between there, wasn't there? Gosh, Tell us a bit. You did your research. We did. I, I, um, I worked in Clare FM for a year and a bit, and then I just had this notion that all my college friends were in Dublin, like having a fantastic time, and I was in Ennis getting up in the middle of the night to, you know, cover the district court, and I was really, I was really unhappy, and I, um, of course. Obviously, people in Dublin weren't living the high life. Most people were on the dole and uh, or doing false courses, and it was actually pretty grim. But I was convinced anyway that I was missing out, so I I left and um, I came back to Dublin. Couldn't get a job in journalism, and I didn't have that much experience. There there wasn't a lot going at the time, and so I worked for a few months in PR, and I was really really dreadful at it. <laughs> and, and I I worked for for. Um, Bill O'Hurley, who a lot of people will remember, because I suppose the late part, and great, yeah, part of many childhoods. And um, after a few months, he did say to me, "Listen, I'll keep you on for another while, but you really should go back to journalism. Your heart isn't in this." And as chance would have it, there were jobs coming up in RTE. They this goes to show that it was a while ago. There was a a labour court ruling on the the place. That there weren't enough staff. I mean, everything now obviously is the other direction. You know, it's all about losing people. This was actually about tr- about creating jobs because news at that time was expanding. I've only relatively recently gone into the era era where there was an hour of news at six o'clock, half an hour at nine, where you know, Morning Ireland was only there a few years. Like everything, it was just more and more rather than less and less. And um, so they employed quite a few people, I think there were about 15 of us in over the space of two or three months and most people who started at that time were relatively young and inexperienced. I mean I suppose we were cheap compared to, to, to anybody else who was out there. So um, yeah, so a couple of years after I left here I, I was back in Dublin and um, back living with my college friends uh, on, on Clonliffe Road <laughs> and working in RTE so yeah. And what was the what was the, was it more the same then once you got to RT in terms of job description? No, because I didn't get out very much to begin with. And first of all, I was reading the news on Two FM, and then my next job after that was as a reporter on Morning Ireland, which I loved. And then I spent a couple of years doing telly, which is fine. Then I was moved to the news at one as a reporter, and I wasn't that keen on that to begin with. But then I started presenting, like just doing stand and stuff, and I kind of thought, and even though. That hadn't been, you know, if, if, if you'd asked me, you know, what my ambition was, like, it wouldn't have been that. I would have been more interested in being a TV correspondent or whatever. But kind of when I started doing it, I thought, yeah, yeah, this isn't so bad. bad. Yeah. You had a fairly few notable stand-in roles as well for some high-profile figures in RT at the time. Yeah, so, so once I started doing that, I mean, one of the things is there were very, very few women at the time. And, and I was relatively young too. I was only about... 27 which in RTE terms is you know RTE is a place where like anybody under 50 is young you know so and it's it's still the case like there are people you know on 2FM who RTE think are young and they're in their 40s you know it's it's it's, it's just what, that what do they think of like Owen McDermott and all that yeah. they must think that they're like, babies yeah they must yeah. be like down to put out the Montessori yeah, yeah exactly yeah, the pressure's on the other side of the car park yeah yeah, yeah. see well that, that that you know there is a certain element of that so so, uh, so I suppose 27 was like, was really quite young and, and I was fortunate, like I did, I did get a, a lot of opportunities. So I did, I used to stand in for, for Pat Kenny, who was doing the morning show at the time and was in a bit of Morning Ireland, a lot of standing in for Sean O'Rourke on the news at one um, and very, just other various bits and pieces. Yeah. Actually on Sean O'Rourke, um, 
we interviewed uh, Kira King. Uh, yes, yeah, so Kira actually did her work experience with, with Sean work and she couldn't speak highly of him enough. Like he was great. Yeah. He was fantastic to me. In fact, going back to you know the the getting the job at, when I was working for Bill O'Hurley, he, um, Sean was one of the people who interviewed me at the time, and he was and he was fantastic. And um, and I I spent four years on the news at one when he was presenting it. I was a reporter, and I used to to stand in for for him as a presenter. And uh, he really was great, and um, you know he'd be he'd be a good friend of mine. And um, yeah, we've 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 had a few laughs down the years. All right. Mm. Um, and obviously one of your standing jobs was the Five Seven Live that became uh, a full time role. So you obviously did a good job there then. I was kind of doing a bit of this and a bit of that and then that came up. I didn't go for it or anything, I got offered it um, and in a way, looking back, I don't know if I was very well prepared for it, it was an awful lot to take on. I'm not saying, you know, obviously presenting a radio programme isn't like, you know, being a nurse on an A&E ward or it's not going down a mine, you know, it's not difficult like that. But I think I was 30, 31 and for me, it was just it was just an awful lot, and I did it for. It six does years. certainly come with its own pressures, for sure. Yeah, it 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 does, and I I just felt that I just I felt I don't know I felt a bit exposed all the time. I felt like there was so much I didn't know, and that like every day was like I I found nearly every day difficult, mm. um and so I did it for six years, and you know it's some great crack in the six years, but I kind of realised that. I needed to go and do a couple of other things just for the sake of my sanity, mm. if nothing else. Well, before I became too institutionalized, that you know, and there is, there is like you know, in a big institution, there is the danger you become institutionalized, and mm. um, that that you, you think that that's all there is, and if you don't go in and do that every day, th- or if you decide to walk away from it, that you're somehow a failure. But uh, so after six years of it, I just thought I need to go out and do something else for a while. So I made documentaries for a couple of years and how did you find that i liked it yeah it's probably I, a slower pace than what you had yeah. been quite you know accustomed to yeah i did i did stuff like it was i remember it was leading up to a general election so i did this thing where i went to every constituency which i think there were 42 of them at the time which so it was completely different like every every week you were in a different place and you had to, you know, ed- edit a half hour documentary every week. So it was it was totally different. And it was just nice to get back to doing stuff like editing. It's and everything. you could sink your teeth into it. Yeah, more, yeah. And that, that you were doing this research and everything. And that it, it was just, it was nice to go back and do that for a while. And, you know, I suppose I always hoped that I'd get back presenting full time again. But I just, I just, you know, I think everybody, I really admire people who, can do the same job for 30 years or whatever but I just wouldn't be one wasn't of them. for you like, no I just would feel the need to so like, even you know, if, let's try something even else if I asked life. you like uh, of all the positions you've held and jobs you've done in RT and Claire Femme or whatever you, if you were to pick your favourite you'd probably say well I wouldn't still want to be doing it for a certain amount of time you want to be moving around doing different things yeah I mean I kind of I like I like what I'm doing now, apart from Morning Ireland, apart from, I mean, nobody likes getting up at half four. <laughs> so, four must be a struggle. I, I set my alarm for 7am and I went straight back to sleep once I went off. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to tell you what time I set mine for, but it was later. Yeah, yeah. half four is the middle of the night. Really. Yeah. Well, it's actually, yeah. technically speaking, I set it for 20 past. I do two snoozes and oh, fair. Get, yeah. fair enough. Yeah, get yourself yeah, in gear. Get, yeah. get, up, get up at half past and leave the house about 10 past five. So yeah, that must be tough. Right? Where, where do you live, Rachel? I, I I don't live that far away. I live in Ramla, so, oh, pretty, so yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm I'm pretty close to work. How yeah, long does so your morning commute generally take? I'm sure you have it down to a tea now at this stage. A, about ten minutes or less. <laughs> oh, so yeah. yeah, so that's you know it's not. I, but I work I work with with um, a woman, Kathy Farrell, who who edits Morning Ireland, who travels from Offaly at that time of the morning. Oh God. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't. I just oh, couldn't I can't do that. that. That's what's kind of happening now with Dublin is that commuting towns are moving further and further away yeah. from the sea like yeah. places like Offaly now and things like and other areas well, always been yeah, yeah. Um, yeah because know. they're they're just that a little bit close enough to Dublin where you can well, really aside from the, the the roadworks at the minute on the on the M50 mm. at their nice 
Apart from that, like the morning commutes. Yeah, them. they're a nightmare. Yeah, well, I have to deal with them every single time. I I'm from Waterford, like, and I. Get... You've mentioned that about three times. Go on. <laughs> yeah. Not on this one though. Uh, but I get the bus home every every weekend to work and stuff like that, and I have to go through that those nice road yeah. It takes like, like ages I don't to get through. Travel from Longford. Um, that's not a real county it's well yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Long, Longford is a myth <laughs> and and places that are kind of a similar distance away are, I think gosh now I know they the, they would say there tend to be people who either spend a lot of time on the road or who start work very early in the morning so you miss all of the traffic mm. but yeah. god yeah and there's so many people doing that and um, it is very very hard Sure, in terms of cost, like, I mean, it wouldn't be sustainable, obviously, but it would be cheaper for me to come from Watford every day rather than oh, yeah. live here yeah. in Dublin. Same but you just, you obviously, I don't know what common college, sense wouldn't. What college experience you'd have. You'd have yeah, oh, you uh, wouldn't. You'd yeah. have none. You'd yeah, have exactly. None. I, I commuted for a year um, when I was in Galway. No, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, um, like, I'd, I'd get the bus from Port... I'd have to get up at five o'clock. I'd have to get the quarter to six bus from Port Leash, get up to O'Connell Bridge, walk over to Tire Street, get the dark down to Dunleary walk 20 minutes oh. and then repeat yeah, I get home rough. around 10 o'clock like I, I complain about my half hour walk but it's really yeah, long I can have my half an hour back yeah. to Marino as well. see that's like and like we have like a lot like a lot of friends from like the likes of Kildare and like yeah. Meath and Par and the like what I'd say the annoying thing for them is they're close enough where commuting is probably the best option but they're far away enough that it's just it's a bit of a trek. Like. UL conundrum for, for yeah, 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 and it's it's I and it's true. I know people like from me or wherever who you know who went to college in Galway just because they knew if they, they, if they went yeah, to Dublin, you know, the thing at home, the thing at home would be, you know, she, you can come home every evening. It sure is. Like, I don't think it's part of the the kind of college experience to live away from you home. Know, it yeah. is like you know you're getting your feet, you're getting your own grounding in the world. Mm. Yeah. Oh sure, I have make your own mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. I have I have a friend who goes to wait back at home, and like he lives in Kilrossenty, which is very much the middle of the county. It's just it, it's near Dungarvan. It's just like ten or so, ten fifteen minutes outside Dungarvan, and he's moved to Waterford. Like it's like the bus to wait would go past near enough his house. But he decided just to move to Waterford for the year, just because he didn't want to get that bus every single day home, up and back. Probably, isn't yeah. that bad. probably not as bad as here. Well, definitely not as bad as here. Probably, yeah. probably. Um, one thing that you're very passionate about, obviously, Rachel, is writing. Yeah. Um, you yeah. you've published a, a number of books. When did the love of writing was that from a very young age that you yeah, enjoyed writing? I, I always wanted to do that, and then you know the way it is when you're at school, like. You know, most people, you can't go in and say, well, actually, I'd like to be a writer. So I, I, it was something that I wanted to do. And then I, other stuff gets in the way. and Career gets in the yeah, way, of course. And, yeah. and I, you know, the need to make money, I suppose, gets in the way as well. Because it's you know, very hard to make money from mm. writing in this country or, you know, enough to live on. I mean, there, there would be relatively few full-time writers here. So I put it off and put it off. And then really I stopped thinking about it. I thought well that's something I'll never do and then I kind of maybe got to that stage where I thought well if I don't do this now I never mm. ever will so about where are we now about seven or eight years ago I decided you know mm. I just I won't tell anybody I'll keep my head down I have an idea I think it's actually it was the, the first idea I had was was pretty much based around my time as a student here in a way or rather a summer I spent in Boston on a J1 when I was a student here. So it, um, obviously the story is completely fictional, but the setting mm. and just the whole notion of what it was like to be in Boston that summer and, and the heat and you know, the fact that it was in a way that now, I know America and Ireland remain very different, but it's, it's hard to describe to people how different America and Ireland were in mm. 1988. It was like a different universe, you know. There, there was just no, or like Ireland was a fairly limited place and a fairly rough and ready kind of place for most people. I mean, I remember we used to walk around the supermarket, you know, just looking at stuff. Oh, look, there's more than two types of bread. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and I, I mean, I mean, oh, look, coffee in plastic cups. Imagine that. But no, <laughs> like, and I'm not, I'm not making this up. Yeah. Like, there, were, there was no such thing. There was no such. There was kind of like there were sliced pans and soda bread. There was like coffee came in a cup and it was you know in a jar and you had a spoon and a half and put some milk on top. Um, there was no. It, it's just everything. Like we we used to be amazed by 
the sheer number of breakfast cereals. <laughs> it was more than cornflakes. There was more than cornflakes, wheat and picks and ready bread. You know, it was everything, like the sheer variety of fruits and vegetables. You'd be kind of pointing at them. See, that's mad because I, What's that? I lived in New York for a couple of months and uh, we found it the exact opposite because we were all we craved was Irish things. And like it wasn't because we were missing home and things. Like their dairy out there is awful. Their meat out there is like fresh fruit and veg, non-existent. Yeah, like that's what we found. It, but it was just all all those little things, just like oh, the way traffic lights would hang over the middle of the road and like all the stuff you'd seen in the films, like, you know, the way the, the kind of the steam rising up through the grating, I mean, that never, ever, ever would happen here. So it's just all that stuff was in my memory. So I sort of built a book around it. And then once you've written one, you kind of have to write another <laughs> one. How long was the um, first one take you? Um, going back to me, I actually wrote it very quickly. Um, it took me about maybe eight or nine months but that was the first draft mm-hmm. and then mm. you know I think especially your first book you know I probably had to do about 20 drafts of it before it was like acceptable to be put out into the world but um so it it I'm not saying it gets easier as you go along but you know I'm writing my fifth book at the moment and it's you st- I suppose you know a bit more about how to structure things and how to how to get into a scene and how to get. Would you have rituals at all before you're writing? Like uh, J.K. Rowling, she has a glass of red wine before she was writing. Harry oh Potter. yeah, and she f- once she's finished, she stops writing. Yeah. Isn't that her thing? Yeah. Hmm. No, I write at the kitchen table most of the time, except when the Wi-Fi is bad and I have to, <laughs> I have to, go, for, I have to go up. I have to go up to the front room because the kitchen's at the bottom of the house, and it's not that big a house, but it's amazing how like five oh. yards can and the Wi-Fi just dies. Yeah. Um. So no, not really. I mean, I I I write in Google Docs and then try, so I suppose I do have kind of rituals like that, as in. I like to do things a certain a way. Certain I like way, to yeah. write about a thousand words in a day and then revisit them the following day and then set them aside for a while before, you know, going back maybe in a month or so's time and revisiting them. So I would I would go over stuff a lot. I find bizarrely that more and more if I want to if I want to edit something and, and rearrange sentences, it's it's kinda handy to use I use my phone a lot because when you look at something in a different size screen it, it's completely different mm. and in a different font so uh, I'm sure I have this feeling that this would work no matter what you're doing for scripts or yeah, essays yeah. or anything that when yeah. you're looking different perspective you, you start, you, and you start noticing oh I'm missing a word there or whatever in a way that if you're looking at the same screen all the time you yeah. don't be, yeah. you don't your, you your mind fills like, in yeah. the blanks for yeah. you whereas you start looking at something on a different screen of course you then end up like with this awful pain <laughs> in your neck but um but yeah, so I, I sort of have rituals, but nothing, nothing. I know some people need total silence mm. or whatever. I, w- I wouldn't, no, I mean, I wouldn't, wouldn't have to radio on in the background or whatever, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't need to shut myself mm. away. Someone came in, made a cup of tea or coffee and shut up, no? Um, a bit, yeah, my husband to be, I know I'm annoying you now, but <laughs> <laughs> everything starts with, I know I'm annoying you now, but, yeah. and then I annoy him by kind of, he'd be saying something to me and I'd go, hmm. Said, you're thinking of that bloody book again. I go, hmm. Mm. <laughs> worse, uh, we interviewed David McCullough last week, and uh, his first, well, it was now fair enough, it was two volumes, it was about him down there. Seven years. Seven yeah. years. Yeah, that's a whole lot. Of that's a lot of time. Yeah, that's it's so much easier making it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't actually have to research yeah, and yeah, fact yeah. check. It's like the difference between, you yeah. know, between sort of doing some creative writing or having to write an essay where you actually have to read a couple of books yeah, or something. Exactly. You know, it's, it's um, I know you have to do a lot of research when you're writing fiction as well in terms of, you know, making sure that you don't make any monstrous mistakes mm. in the time and the period you're writing about. But there's... It's not quite the same. And for someone who's not actually a full-time writer, technically, you are quite prolific in how often you release books. I mean, there's been a few now in the past few years. Is that something that you've been conscious of? Um, I think you, most people would say to you that there, there is a certain amount of pressure there from, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a publisher, there is a mm. kind of element and if it, come on now. And like, if you have success like you have had, I mean, there is pressure to follow up and continue and stuff like that. Yeah, now I've kind of, I've kind of screwed it up this year in that I wrote a bit of a book and I wasn't a hundred percent sure about it. And then I got another idea and I went to the editor and said, and she said, 
I'll just abandon what you're writing and go oh, to the new no. one. So I won't have, a, I should have had, a, you know. A book for Christmas release. A book out next year and I won't, it'll be the following year. But, but I'm, I'm kind of happier with, with, um, with the one I'm writing now. And it's, it's, I do want to return to the other one because it's the first book I've it's written. It's on the bin, it's on the shelf. Yeah, it's, 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 it's up in the cloud and um, at the back of the computer. It's the first thing I've written that's set in a newsroom. So I was oh, kind of, okay. yeah, but it was, do you know what? In a way, maybe I was too bogged down in detail because you want to, you know, you know the way when you've read lots of things that are set in newsrooms and you find yourself going, well, that would never happen. That would, I want I, I want so much for it to be accurate that there's actually too much detail and right. you end up sacrificing the story. Um, and I know an editor reading a go, well, there's no need to tell people that. And I find myself going, but there is a need to <laughs> know exactly where the news editor sits uh, as opposed to where the director of news is. You know, so it's it's. Um, I'll return to it, but maybe not for a while. And do you think um, writing could ever be a full time thing? Then, if you ever, you know leave besides that RT is you've you've run your course I'd like to think that I would be able to do it one day yeah, yeah. I mean I, I'm lucky at the moment I'm doing Morning Ireland part time and I'm able to write part time so that's not so bad and I'm fortunate to be able to do that yeah I would one day yeah. I would like to it's so different like it's so um, it's so anti-social compared to news which is such a and especially, you know, daily radio programs, you know, yeah. like there's such a, there's such a be very chaotic thing. on, like on a busy day, be very yeah. chaotic. And yeah. then just sit in a room, writing, sinus is a good yeah, they're, very, they're very starkly contrast, you know. Yeah. I, I suppose it probably is a nice blend yeah. for, for yourself and as well. Yeah, for your head, I think it is. Because one, one is all the company and all the crap, but it's also mm. all the hassle. Yeah. Mm. Whereas the other one is just kind of you and the stuff in your head. So mm. it's, it's, so it's, it's completely the opposite mm. in many ways um, from from going in early in the morning and everything is now, now, now mm -hmm. as opposed to coming um, back and yeah, yeah just have there been any days in the studio where it's just been complete chaos like really standout days a lots lots and lots <laughs> uh, where you, oh, well, last, only last week like there was a moment one morning where we had nothing to go to all the lines went down and I can't remember something materialised at the last moment in the end um, but say I, I think I mean the time I would always think of is is during the recession or kind of around the time the, the IMF came in that, and the government collapsed that you would never know what was going to happen from day to day yeah. so you'd go in say we'd have our conference call at night like you know we, we like every you know the morning and evening editors and the presenters have a chat at night and then you sort of say well, we'll be doing this in the morning xyz and then you find yourself getting a text at 20 past 11 saying such and such a minister has resigned <laughs> you know everything everything was a bit crazy and nobody knew what was happening so the mornings tended to be kind of crazy as well but yeah i mean there's I suppose once upon a time I would have been I would have been very uptight about chaos and now I kind of think well people just have to realize that you know sometimes it doesn't work out which is not to say that you won't get lots of complaints when things don't work out and you obviously don't know what you're talking about but that's you know, it's just the nature yeah. of just live kind of radio. There's, there's um, just the way it is. I think we'll do a bit of getting to know you. Yeah, and then I'm going to tell you to go away. Yeah. <laughs> and I, yeah. I'm leaving, yeah. Oh, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm not going to explain that either, Rachel. I'm no. just going to tell them to leave. <laughs> Rachel, we, we kind of do this, we have enough um, of Yeah, point. eventually we just tell them to leave. minutes in general is about as much as we can tolerate, Gavin, yeah. in one sitting. Yeah. Rachel, tea or coffee? Coffee. How do you take your coffee? Mm. Uh, either... Cappuccino in the morning, later in the day, a uh, Americano with milk. Fair, yeah. I do better, actually, yeah. No. Oh, no. Yeah. Very similar, actually. Um, three people you'd invite to a dinner party, alive or dead? Oh, God, that's a difficult one. <laughs> I suppose, I, um, I mean, can, do they have to be people I don't know? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah or it can be anybody. anybody. Okay, so aim on my husband. First of all, because mm, diplomatic there. No, <laughs> you know what? He he'll be there anyway. Okay, so, so he'll be there. Yeah. he'll be there anyway. So who would I most like to meet in the world? Basically, and much, chat with. Pretty much. Um, Anne Tyler, the American author, to talk about writing. Um, 
Bruce Springsteen, my hero since I was 14. I remember not that long ago, uh, well, it must have been a little while ago, I think it was One Direction were on the Late Late Show and I happened to be at home and there was like lots of screaming girls outside RTE, you see. And my father says, who did you like when you were that age? And I said, same fella I like now. And he said, you've been following that fella around for 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> and and if you got, I, I assume you've had the chance to see him live then over the lots course of that. Lots and lots of times. Yeah. yeah, lots and lots of times. Dave McCullough, I think. Oh, he'd be more fanatical he's, he's than I He's seen 26 yeah. times. Yeah. No, he said it was 30-something in 20-something. Oh, yeah, in 20-something well, well, years. I would only be up at maybe about the 15. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's <laughs> all, that's all. You're not a real fan. No, I'm not. I'm, 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 I'm very fair weather in comparison to Dave. <laughs> And if I had to pick a third person, um, somebody sporty, maybe a oh, you know who was who who was very entertaining and um, who I think would would add to the occasion. No, it would be Anthony Daly. Oh, okay. mm, yeah, Daly, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Good chance he could be nice the next Dublin manager any day now. Yeah, yeah, yeah coming back again, yeah. <laughs> again, yeah, yeah, coming back again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it'd be nice to have him back managing Clare one day, but. Um, mm-hmm. So off the top of my head, I'm sure I'll leave here and think of a thousand others. <laughs> but those are three who I think would. Can't believe you didn't you didn't say Davy Fitz. <laughs> I actually I I'm a big fan of Davy. I met him at the weekend. Is yeah, he nothing? was he was down in I work in a bookshop in Waterford and he was down doing a a signing for his book that's oh, okay. that he released there recently. Yeah. yeah. So I was chatting away to him there. Oh, Davy's a great character. Like he's lovely. Don't know how, yeah how he, how would he go down at a dinner party? He might puck the head off somebody. <laughs> yeah, like, he could inflammatory. Yeah, in dinner fact, party could be over. Yeah, be over exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, except I don't. A couple of years ago, um, I was out um at home with my parents who were just having a bite to eat, and who was in the same place only Davy. So I went over and said hello and brought him over. Um, because even though like we'd be from a few miles down the road from each other, my parents didn't know him so he came over and sat down and chatted to us for about 20 minutes and oh. he was charm itself yeah so oh, um, no, like there, was even no, when, there was no wild stuff i mean he was scheduled to be in the shop from 12 to half one but he was spending so much time talking to the fans that it ran and he was supposed to be in wex the wexford shop for three but he ran into nearly half two by the time he was finished oh. with everybody because he was just chatting so much to people yeah he has a lot of time for everyone, I think. He does. He's. I gather from from people at home that you know, if you have him to present medals or whatever to yeah. do your fourteens, that like you get you get the full on. You know, there's no there's no dashing in and dashing mm-hmm. out and sorry lads, I have other places to be. That that he he's very very generous with yeah. his time. Right. Unfortunately, uh, well, Gavin, I'm, out of, I'm out of here. Gavin has to depart. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Last okay, con- last contact. We're not. You. We're not just telling them to like you know no, f off. Okay, we may have fabricated. It. Well, actually, oh. there is a degree of an element of truth to it. He does piss me off. No <laughs> end. The feelings mutual. Yeah. But, uh, uh, Gavin has a radio show. Gavin has a radio show oh, very at good. this time. Oh, okay. He uh, yeah. yeah he he dabbles without us. He cheats on us about them. Yeah. And what's, what's, you guys what's, what's the what's the other radio show? It's a, a music show. I'm just hosting myself, basically getting people on every week. I just discuss music. Uh, what music they like. Why they like it? Current um, music events. Yeah, and current music like events, and just kind of getting, kind of see what the students around here, what they listen to, get a different, uh, bit of taste every week. You know, so pretty good. That's right. Have fun, Gav. Uh, lovely here. We'll try. And... Bread. <laughs> 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 you always have to make one clagger, don't you? I'll leave, I'll leave. Yeah, good. Get nice out. meeting you, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You got money. Good luck. See you, Gav. <laughs> We might as well continue to get to know you. Yeah, sure. Um, so we talked about coffee, but if you were to take a stronger drink now, what would be a drink of choice? A white wine, white wine. or gin and tonic. What, what type of white? That would be uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Oh. The mo- New Zealand, the most expensive one. Oh. But, uh, yeah. G and Ts are becoming very popular amongst yeah, our kind of friends. Of oh, tickers! I wouldn't have one. Oh, so you wouldn't be that fussy. No, yeah, that's kind yeah. Of like you know, pork exactly. dry I'm, I'm very and, uh, glad you didn't just turn around. Oh, can I get a Hendrix with a slice no, of lime? No, and no, 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 I'm not a city glass either. Like you yeah. know, uh, the, the big, no, bo- the no, fish no, bowl no, glasses. No, yeah. No, 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 cork dry gin with with like a bit of Schweppes. Yeah, yeah, that that'd be that'd be fine. Um, one thing I wanted to ask was, uh, you were born in Lincolnshire, but was the family was originally. Irish were they? My dad is Irish but my mother is from Lincolnshire and, and was there ever a possibility that you could have grown up in England yeah. rather than Ireland? Yeah yeah so, so I'd, be living, I'd, I'd, no, I'd probably be living in Brexit central now yeah, yeah. Oh, which gosh, is what yeah. Lincolnshire has become um, including like my own family seem to be torn down the middle on it. Very oh, um, okay. It's 
Uh, no, my father went over to England, um, left Limerick, County Limerick, um, went over there, worked with horses and um, um, my mother lived in the next village and that's mm. how they met and then they came back here in the 70s. So yes, yes, I could have grown up. Your dad used to sure. provide the, the, your horse racing tips on Fair yeah. FM, actually I yeah. forgot about that. He's uh, yeah, he's very he's very he's always been into horses and um, he's you know he's in his eighties now and he's, he's he's still goes down to the races. Yeah, yeah, he does not as much, but he has he has he's at the races and he's racing post and you mm-hmm. know the whole the whole thing. And he he's not a big gambler, but he just he just keeps it interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's I I really do think it's one of those things as well that you know say with my dad like if you said to him now here are some you know sums he'd go no 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 no, i wouldn't know anything about that if you give him the most convoluted bet in the world and he'd say well if that comes in now you'd get 127 (laughs) 50 and you know it is knows the odds inside out yeah and it is also i think when you get older like in terms of you know you always read this stuff about people should do sudokus and things i think people should do convoluted bets (laughs) (laughs) my bit of money of it yeah yeah he like he 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 can just calculate these things so much more quickly than, Mm. than a calculator or a computer could and was it a sporting household or was it just the, mainly the horses that he was interested in? No, he'd be interested in hurling as yeah. well. Yeah, I was going to ask you. Limerick man. He, well, he's, he was, you see, he, he's very, he has all his bases covered. He was born in Waterford, so they, say hey, he uh, grew up in Limerick. His father was in Tipperary and he's lived a large part of his life in Clare, so he's well covered. He's well, yeah. Yeah. Hurling strongholds of the lot of them, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Clare would be his first team and then Waterford and then Limerick. Oh. Um, um, if all else fails and it's only say tip or left versus Kilkenny sure at least tip. at least one of the horses came in and that's because since <laughs> this year then Limerick obviously yeah. picking up the uh, the yeah. yeah. my 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 mom my ma- and her extended family are all from Limerick so oh, okay. yeah there was there was a bit of buzz about the place uh, when when they won back in September all right um Greg do you have any final things to to wrap us up um yes uh so Gav asked the dinner party one. Rachel, a Saturday night, everything is completely within your... You're Bruce Almighty with the remote. What do you want to do? And how do you, how do, you do it? You can like, watch anything. You, you can, can do, do anything, anything you want, literally. Anything. The parameters... You can get to a, a sold-out concert. You can do whatever you like. Yeah. Your Saturday night, you get to plan it. Okay, currently, it would be... I would like... And I'm, it's not going to happen now, but... I would like to have seen Bruce Springsteen on Broadway. So right. that 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 oh, actually, you mentioned David McCullough. I know he did. Did yeah. he? Know? Yeah. I think he yeah. said that um, his ideal Saturday night would be to do that again. Yeah. He did. Yeah. yeah he uh, said because his wife said that he or he said that his wife bought him tickets and um, yeah. He that's if he was to pick anything to do, it would be that again. I, w- I would really, really, and I, I I'd like to have done that. I think it's due to end pretty shortly. So you know, um. unless. Unless I win the lotto <laughs> in the next few weeks, because it's very hard to get a ticket unless you buy them on the black market, and, and that's yeah. four or five figures. I could yeah. in Broadway, you know, where you stand up at the yeah, yeah. I've on that, but we didn't get tickets. No, well. no. So it's I've kind of looked up the prices and thought, nah, it's not going to mm. happen. So I en- I did enter the the ticket lottery several times, and my number never came up. Oh, so, so what's the plan for the rest of the day, Rachel? I am. I'm going to go home and, and do a bit of writing. I'm really seriously behind now on the next book. So um, yeah, so I better go home and try and get a few words down. I'm <laughs> at that stage now as well where I really want to do it and and like I'm finding, especially because the last few weeks at work have been really busy between presidential election and just like Brexit is always there mm-hmm. and there just always seems to have been something over the last while. So I'm kind of like touch wood fingers crossed that it'll calm down a bit now and um that i can you know sort of carve out a larger place in my brain for for writing over certainly between now and christmas um well next time you do launch a book uh make sure to keep my workplace in mind for a signing where advice do you work the book center in oh, Waterford. very good yeah. very good the, uh, my last book I remember was a book of the week or something yeah because I remember it did really well it was yeah, yeah. So my thanks bo- very much my, my, my uh, Waterford yeah no my boss was um quite quite happy with me when I told her that I was going to be bringing you on the show she's a big fan of your books <laughs> oh that's 
that's lovely. Yeah. Thanks a million. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah no, you, you'll be more than welcome down for a signing or a launch or anything well, like that. When, yeah. the next, when the next one comes out, which won't be until early 2020. I'll get on to you straight I'll, away. I'll definitely be down that way. Um, yeah, perfect. I think, I think we're kind of naturally at the end. Before we do go, I'd like to thank my dear mother, who has recently uh, decided to support us a little bit financially to uh, get our name out there in terms of sponsors or getting advertising, things like that. And I think it's fair to just say that my mom does uh, own and run a shop in Waterford and in Newcastle West called The Dresser. Uh, it's a lovely little gift shop where you can buy gifts for weddings, anniversaries, birthdays, the entire lot, as well as bake, baking goods, uh, handbags, everything you need. I'll so, look after you. And will look after She's you. Sweetheart. Exactly. Um, thank you very much to my mother. Uh, I did. She did. She actually didn't ask me to say that as well. Oh, I, I rang. I rang her up this morning and was like, "Right, okay, you've given us this little bit of cash. What do you want me to say about the shop?" Um, because my dad did say you should say something about the yeah. shop, and I was like, "Yeah, no, fair." We trusted, yeah. yeah. We so I said. Um, uh, is there anything you'd like me to say? And she was like, God, no, I gave you that because I want you to do well, not because of the shop, but it's it's only fair. Uh, so uh, for any of your gift needs, uh, please check out The Dresser. Uh, you can purchase um, online, we can deliver. Um, yeah, and it's in Georgia Street on Watford and in Newcastle West as well. So thank you to my mum. Uh, for that uh, this has been In Conversation with Rachel English thank you very much for coming out today Rachel I hope you enjoyed your experience yeah, you. I hope you enjoyed the... you can see it she's buzzing to go home yeah. get some words down yeah. all this nostalgic talk has, has, has got her in the mind frame for it yeah exactly <laughs> um, yeah this has been In Conversation with thank you very much for listening and we'll see you again soon see you again soon see you again soon see you again soon see you again soon, see you again soon.